mankind is just one of three different sorts of anthropomorphic creatures, that is, beings with human form revealed in the Bible. In fact, there are four clearly distinguished anthropomorphic types. Male genetic mankind in the likeness of Adam, men. Female genetic mankind in the likeness of Eve, women. Angels and resurrection folk who, according to Christ in Luke 20, do not marry or non-genetic uh, and are also is angeloi or equal with the angels but distinct from the angels. That four-point scheme is archetypal. That is, it existed in the mind of God, the Creator, before any of these creatures came into existence. We know that because Christ refers to resurrection man as an existing species, even though chronologically resurrection man did not exist when he referred to this species in Luke 20. So he was referring to something that was future, and yet because it was archetypal, he treated it prophetically as though it had already happened because he knew the inevitability of it, that there had to be a resurrection species of man and he refers to it in that light in Luke 20. So there are these four varieties of human form existence, men, women, angels, and resurrection folk. And whenever you deal with an archetype such as that, you're going to find it somewhere else. For example, in the four overall divisions of the Jewish tabernacle or temple scheme. In other words, this idea is so great and so important to God that it's going to recur in other media. There are going to be other concrete situations in which this pattern is going to recur. Now to understand the human races, you have to reason from this archetype of men, women, angels, and resurrection folk. It's quite clear that these four classes of human form creatures correlate, for example, with another version of the archetype, the four element, four humor scheme. We know that because the Bible emphatically states that Adam, not Eve, was created out of the dust of the earth. And from that we know that Adam has a special relationship to the dust of the earth, and therefore with the element of the earth, which is one of the four elements in the, in the four element, four humor concept. From this we recognize that male genetic mankind, in the likeness of Adam, correlates with the element of earth and therefore with the melancholic humor. Men are obsessive worriers as a class, melancholic, obsessive, care-ridden creatures, living by the sweat of their brow, worried, concerned, taking over certain responsibilities that make them melancholic. That's the lot of male genetic mankind, or men, made of the dust of the earth. Angels, in contrast, the messenger race, correlate with the element of air and with the sanguine humor, because, to use a tragic example, Satan, a definitive though malign angel, is termed by the Bible prince of the power of the air. Resurrection man correlates with the royal element of fire because of his repeated association with the sun, which we know to be a great fusion machine. You can't get hotter than that. The hottest fire we know virtually is the sun. And resurrection man is repeatedly associated with the sun. In 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter, Malachi 4, the su suggestion of it, and the conclusion of the parable of the wheat and the tares all associate resurrection man with the sun and therefore with the royal element of fire. Finally, the type of Eve, genetic female mankind, correlates with the gentle phlegmatic humor, the principle of interpersonal sensitivity, female sensibility as it's called, the quality of grace implicit in the element of water. So men are earthy, women watery, angels airy, and resurrection men fiery. Now that last point, for example, is a cultural fact. If you're investigating the choleric humor, you're investigating unweeping man. As choleric Beethoven put it very, very frankly, he spelled this out. He understood this. He was an artist and he was a choleric artist. That is a strong-willed, volitional artist who projects strong will in his music. And he said point blank in German, I won't quote the German, but he said that artists are fiery and do not weep. Now, see, there was a choleric artist who knew that. He knew that artists are fiery and do not weep. These are his words in translation. He knew what he was talking about because he's referring there to the empowered artist who, because of his artistic empowerment, because of his driven or compulsive nature to create, uh, is simulating the power of resurrection man. There's a, there's a tie-in between the life of a creative artist and the life of resurrection man. And so we have this artist, Beethoven, saying that artists are fiery and do not weep. Now, the sensitive people in the audience 
Audiences or receivers have a fundamentally different psychology from the artists who move them. And the people in the audience, the receivers, the women, might weep, and all of us have that dimension. Any artist can turn into a consumer of art at any moment. So you can switch over from being a choleric fire over to being a phlegmatic uh, sensibility to receive what others have done. And then, of course, that can move you to tears. And so the receivers of art can easily weep. But an improvising pianist like Beethoven pours out a kind of volitional fire from his fingers rather than water from his eyes. So that when Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus, even though he was destined to become the great resurrection man, he wasn't resurrection man yet, so we see him weeping for Lazarus in his mortal condition, and he was doing so as a son of the woman, both Eve and of Mary, a very special relationship to femininity because he didn't have a human father, and he was prophesied to be the son of the woman from the beginning with Eve, and so Christ is the representative uh, phlegmatic in that sense because he is the son of the woman, bearing the stamp of their female phlegmatic sensitivity to and concern for others. It's that phlegmatic dimension of Christ, which is only one dimension of him, that Walt Whitman is referring to in the second phlegmatic section of his remarkable four-part four poem, Chanting the Square Deific, which I recommend not for its theological aberrations, but for its clear understanding of the four-element, four-humor conception, where the four-humor concept comes across so clearly albeit with certain biased ideas characteristic of Whitman's time. Literature is filled with the four humors because God's universe is filled with the metaphysics of the four elements. They're just so pervasive. They're so real. This is such a dominant archetypal structure in reality. And this great archetypal pattern holds the key to the racial types, and that's where we're headed, an account of what the races are and what they mean. The racial types which exist to the greater glory of God precisely to illustrate the four anthropomorphic types within humanity. In other words, there's a racial type, in other words, a race, that illustrates in a special way male genetic mankind, another race that illustrates the phlegmatic qualities of female genetic mankind, another race that displays the distinguishing quality of the airy angels, and still another racial strain that shows us the fiery, strong-willed, unweeping character of resurrection man. The races exist for the purpose of displaying these qualities, and they originated at the outset of human existence in Adam and Eve and their sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. The Bible gives us just those five names at the foundation of human existence, and because Cain was clearly Eve's proper son or male alter ego, she's presented as such, he's presented as such in Genesis 4, we can trace the four basic races back to those four foundational males, Adam, Cain, Abel, and Seth. These were the patriarchal founders of the four races who inhabited the four lands outlined in Genesis 2, the lands of the four rivers, the two specifically named lands of Cush and Havilah, and the lands surrounding the antediluvian Tigris and Euphrates rivers. It's a four-point geographic system created by God for the purpose of housing, giving environments to the original antediluvian versions of the four racial types. In the four-element framework, it's self-evident that Adam was black and the proper founder of the antediluvian Negro race of the antediluvian land of Cush. Uh, why do we know he's black? Well, he was made of the dust of the earth, the traditional element of the melancholic humor. The term melancholic derives from the Greek word for black. So the black people of the world exist for the purpose of displaying one of the four anthropomorphic forms. Male, genetic, mankind are simply men. Negroes, in other words, are virile. They display in a special way the characteristics of men. They're the most virile or man-like of the races. The traditional pattern of Enslaving blacks, for example, which is socially unjust, nevertheless derived from Adam's humiliation in the fall, and more particularly from the breadwinning, laboring function of the male adult in the family. In other words, it was the black man down d uh, digging the Panama Canal for us, and that's the kind of thing that a man does for his wife, you see. Now, that might bother some people, but we're dealing with reality here. And I'm, I don't think it'll bother the blacks. They ought to be proud of themselves for digging the Panama Canal so that we are what we are because of that activity. But what we're saying is that this race displays the characteristic qualities of male genetic mankind or men. This black trait then has nothing to do 
absolutely nothing to do with the curse on Canaan, who was white, which we'll try to display later, demonstrate later, that's the case, and certainly it has nothing to do with the mark of Cain, who was not only white, but was the first white man. So, in other words, any notion of the curse on Canaan or the, or the mark of Cain having something to do with negritude is the very reverse of the truth. It's a big lie, is what it is. It simply isn't the case. Now, if you want to think that negritude means something, there's a line in uh, Puddinghead Wilson that deals with a racial problem, Mark Twain's novel, a very penetrating novel, and at one point Tom Driscoll says, why were blacks made? Well, that's like asking why Adam was made and why he was made of the dust of the earth and why he lives by the sweat of his brow. That question is a human question, and it's a question that goes to the root of what it is to be a man because you're talking about masculinity when you talk about blacks. That's simply the truth. Eve was not created from the dust of the earth, but from Adam's rib, a bone. The white or yellow color of bone is a clue that Eve and her proper son Cain were the founders of the white or Caucasoid race. In other words, the whites are the race that display the phlegmatic ethos or character of female genetic mankind. It doesn't mean that white men are women, but it does mean that, comparatively speaking, the white race is somewhat effeminate in thousands of ways. This isn't hidden in a corner. In, in millions of ways, we're looking at a race which has a set of characteristics, characteristic of the phlegmatic temperament, and in many ways characteristic of female genetic mankind. There are many evidences of this. For example, the New Testament pictures the church as the bride of Christ. Because of the way the Apostle Paul concentrated on the Greeks and the way he and Peter died at Rome, professing Christianity took root in Europe, the predominantly white continent. I can remember a black student of mine who sat down across from me who was asking me a penetrating question. He said, well, why is it that there's so much Christianity in Europe? What, what makes me a black man different? Why, why don't we have Christendom down in Africa? You could ask the same question. Why don't we have Christendom in the Mongoloid world? What's so special about white people? Well, what's so special about white people? They're certainly not better than other people, but they have this feminine trait, and the church is the bride of Christ. So there's a mystery, and it's a racial mystery. And uh, we don't have revelation in the scriptures on race, but race has been given to us as an empirical fact. We're there to put it together as best we can and to work on our intuitions. And the bride of Christ aspect of the church explains in part why the church historically is centered in the continent of Europe. Now, for example, the Greek mythologists, and the Greeks, of course, are Europeans and predominantly white, the Greek mythologists understood this relationship because the continent is named, of course, for Europa, a woman carried into the continent by Jupiter, the king of the gods, mythological being, in the form of a white bull, symbolic of a white genetic stock. So there's a tradition that whiteness was reserved for Europe. And it came into Europe in the form of a wimma, female, uh, carried by a white bull. The capstone of this logic is the way the classic, and this is the key, this really demonstrates this feminine Europe polarity, which is part of the white heritage. The capstone of this logic is the way the classic European church, the Roman Catholic, gives a central focal place to divine maternity in the Virgin Mary, who clearly functions. Of course, the Virgin Mary is the Virgin Mary. And the, it was the Greek church that gave her the title Mother of God because in many ways she was the Mother of God because she bore the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But in the Roman Catholic system of Europe, and that you're, you're referring there not just to a religious heritage but to a cultural heritage, uh, the Virgin Mary clearly functions as representative of the white or Caucasoid ethos as female. In other words, the European people have a thing about women. They identify with women. And therefore, the great European church would naturally identify with this great woman, the mother of Jesus Christ, who bore him in a virgin state. The white race exists to demonstrate the special phlegmatic qualities of female genetic mankind or women. Now, the angelic messenger type of humanoid is a distinct type of humanoid. The angels are not men. They're not human but they are displayed by one of the human races. In other words, we're dealing with the transference of an archetype here. And just as we have angels, we have angel-like men. 
and an angel-like race. And it's neither white nor black. We're dealing here with the with a third race, the eagle race, the red Amerindian or hook-nosed strain, the aquiline race, named, of course, for that very characteristic Roman word, aquila, the eagle. Now, this race derived from Abel and inhabited the antediluvian land of Havilah, presumably the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, opposite Cush, Ethiopia. On the color scale, this race is dark intermediate between the Negroes and the Mongoloids. But the really definitive trait observable in many races classified as white, because you see, this is a very complex issue that we're dealing with here, because you've got reflections of each race in each other race. So in other words, you have a quasi-Negro version of whites, you've got a quasi-Amerindian version of whites, you've got a quasi-Mongoloid version of whites, and so forth. This is a very complex issue. And the really definitive trait of the eagle or quasi-angelic race, observable in many races that are white, in skin color is the aquiline or eagle nose facial concavity with thin lips the noble red man is a type of the angels and the pagan amerindians of north america were tragically familiar with the prince of the power of the air for this reason the amerindians of mexico were given to bird feathers and flowers the aerial and the aromatic in the Diluvian family who survived the flood, this race of Havilah was carried forward by the red matriarch, one woman who represented this stock, this special stock, and her son by Noah, the patriarch Ham, whose name is actually cognate with the Greek messenger god Hermes, one of his paganized versions equivalent to Zahuti or Thoth, the god of Hermopolis in Egypt, the land of Ham. The Greeks understood that Ham or Hermes was a carrier for the red, sanguine, angelic strain, the messenger st uh, race. Consequently, Ham is likened to a messenger, a messenger god, Hermes or Mercury. Finally, the race that types resurrection man is Noah's own Sethite race, the Mongoloids of East Asia. Noah's predominantly Sethite or Mongoloid family survived the end of all flesh, pronounced in Genesis 6.13, precisely because Noah found grace in the context of a race, the Sethite race, the race of Seth, symbolic of resurrection man, who is no longer flesh. Noah was, of course, a man of flesh, but his distinctive race symbolized the choleric humor, the royal element of fire, and the mighty, solar, unweeping resurrection version of mankind, yet to be revealed, because the only resurrection man that now exists is Jesus Christ. There are no other actual resurrection men but the mongoloid people those yellow people the mongols and the koreans and the chinese and the japanese and other mongoloid people represent a human race derived from seth son of adam who are created for the purpose or distinguished for the purpose of showing us something about future resurrection man noah derived from that dis uh, distinctive race uh, from the patriarch seth the appointed one, the youngest of the four foundational males, born 130 years uh, after, not after the flood, but uh, when Adam was 130 years old, uh, before the flood. Just as resurrection man is the youngest or latest of the four anthropomorphic breeds to be created. So Seth was born last and resurrection man comes last. The only resurrection man who now exists is Jesus Christ the ultimate heir of the messianic or imperial line of Genesis 11. And that line took rise from the marriage between Noah's son Shem and the yellow matriarch, Noah's Sethite or mongoloid kinswoman. Although the messianic line was soon divided into a white, or I should say diverted, into a white or caucasoid channel, our fox had one son of Shem and the yellow matriarch was the founder of the line and like Noah, a mongoloid man. What we're saying is the messianic line took rise from a specifically mongoloid man. And that's appropriate because the ultimate Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the first resurrection man. So you start the line from a mongoloid stock, a race symbolic of resurrection man, and you end the line with a man who probably didn't look very mongoloid, probably predominantly white or whatever he was, you know, of the tribe of Judah. And that particular man then becomes the first literal resurrection man, fulfilling the type established through the mongoloid race. This is the race of fire and of strong, unweeping volition, as aptly represented by the Mongol Chinggis Khan, Temuchin, who created the greatest empire the world has known almost overnight through strength of will, 
the Messianic line is an imperial line, and somehow that fellow, that Mongol, Temuchin, through some means that we don't know about, uh, some spiritual trigger of some kind, decided to realize that messianic privilege of the, uh, of the imperial line. Not that he was a messiah. What it was, he was a member of that race who, whose very existence was predicated on the future triumph of resurrection man and who therefore um, were the foundation of the messianic line. As we said, Arphaxed I, son of Shem, son of Noah, Arphaxed I was a predominantly mongoloid man born two years after the flood. So Temuchin, the uh, Chinggis Khan, was uh, a definitive mongoloid and very characteristic in his behavior uh, of unweeping choleric man. The Europeans referred to the Mongols as the scourge of God. They were right, and they haven't seen the last of the Mongol principle, the yellow peril, the aristocracy of resurrection man. The Mongol Empire was a clue, and Pearl Harbor a hint. A basic issue is what sort of causal mechanism established the four races in Adam, Cain, Abel, and Seth. We have to begin with the fact that genetically, Adam and Eve were totally unique human beings without human parents. They were never born, they were made. That genetic uniqueness means that we are dealing with a new set of unidentified genetic rules or natural laws, consistent with the later genetic rules, but distinct simply because the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, are different from the middle. There's something unique about Adam and Eve. They had no parents, and therefore you expect genetic uniqueness from them. Certain things we see in ordinary parents are heightened or raised. There are certain capacities there that we don't know about, but we can discover through the effects. A unique human pair, Adam and Eve, had unique genetic qualities and potentiality. And that uniqueness somehow resulted in a full array of these racial types illustrating men, women, angels, and resurrection man through these four races of those four men we've already named. A strong clue to the mechanism necessary to bring about this quick formation of these races appears in Genesis 5.3, which reads, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. We're struck with the long interval of 130 years and with the way Seth pairs off with Adam, just as Cain pairs off with Eve in Genesis 4.1, the preceding chapter. In fact, Genesis 4.1 and 2 treats both Cain and Abel as sons of Eve without mentioning Adam just as 5.3 treats Seth as a son of Adam without mentioning Eve. Clearly, that contrasting pattern in Genesis 4 and 5 is the key to our genetic mechanism. It means that Cain and Abel and their Caucasoid and Amerindian aquiline races were reckoned Eve's sons and Eve's people. In other words, the Amerindians, the Reds, and the Whites are both peoples or races of Eve. One fair-skinned, Cain, and the other one dark-skinned, Abel. The same logic applies to Adam. He generated an analogous pair, some unidentified Negro patriarch that the scriptures don't refer to, to act as a carrier for his own name, Adam, and his own uh, racial tendency toward dark skin. And then Seth, who is named and who became the, his fair-skinned son, Ma, uh, the mongoloid patriarch, named in 5.3. So Eve had a light and a dark pair, Cain and Abel, and Adam had a light and a dark pair. And in both cases, now, of course, we say that Eve had these two and Adam had these two. They were married. They made it. In other words, all four sons were born by the original pair. But chapter 4 stresses uh, a pair of sons who favored Eve, just as in any family. And uh, the other two, uh, Seth and this unidentified Negro patriarch, favored Adam. In both cases, the lighter son appears to come first, Cain before Abel and Seth before the unidentified carrier of Adam's black trait. The genetic mechanism capable of accounting for all this is the well-defined pattern in which married couples have pairs of contrasting children, one favoring the father and the other the mother. And as far as I know, all families are that way. Every family I've ever known anything about, my own family and close kinsmen of mine have always had pairs of children, one of which favors the father and the other one favors the mother. And that is what accounts for this oscillation back and forth in Genesis 4 and 5. Genesis 5.3 states that Seth bore Adam's likeness in a special way. 
although the mongoloids are fair skinned so they do not attest to Adam's dark skin they share with the Negroes that is the mongoloids share with the Negroes a tendency toward the same sort of flat face with flat noses in sharp contrast to the aquiline except in cases where the aquiline may have been blended back into black or yellow stocks and there are some cases the Papuans of New Guinea are dark Negro people and yet they have aquiline noses which is a remarkable trait but that's because of this mixture that went on in the family of Noah after the flood in order to form an even larger array you're not working on the basis of four races when you get to Noah's family you're working on the basis of four sixteen thirty two heaven knows how many and as I say normally the aquiline we don't find the aquiline trait among most blacks but some black races do display that aquiline trait so from this we gather that Adam was not only dark skin that's one of his traits but also that he had a convex face with a small flat nose Eve was not only fair skin but had a concave face with an aquiline nose that's what you would deduce from the Cain Abel association with Eve and with the association of Seth with Adam her two proper sons that is Eve's Cain and Abel were begotten by Adam but favored the mother so that Cain displayed her fair skin and became the ancestor of the Caucasoids or the whites and Abel favored her aquiline nose and became the the patriarch of the uh, the red race and the aquiline tendency although some red people again display the red color type but do not display aquiline noses so this is all very complex Adam's influence was seen in Abel's darker skin and conversely it may have been that Cain had more of Adam's convex face Seth reproduced Adam's facial type more clearly but displayed a fairer skin than Adam under Eve's influence and the original Negro patriarch with Adam's dark skin may have displayed something of Eve's aquiline nose like the dark Papuans of New Guinea that I've already mentioned still overall Cain and Abel looked more like Eve and Seth and the unidentified Negro patriarch looked more like Adam so humanity displays two races of Eve and two races of Adam the two races of Eve the whites and reds have lived side by side not too amicably in colonial North America and the two races of Adam the blacks and yellows are co-inhabitants of the Austronesian linguistic stock including yellow Malays and black Melanesians however the races were not paired off in that way in the antediluvian world of Genesis 2 instead the darker skinned races reds and blacks were paired off in the adjacent lands of Cush and Havilah presumably Ethiopia and southern Arabia the red and black colors appear together in a number of different cultural contexts such as a red and black arrow ritual in Aboriginal North America the two fair-skinned races the Sethites and Cainites dominate the narrative text and genealogies of the antediluvian world and inhabited the two the Genesis 2 lands defined by the two rivers of Mesopotamia the Tigris and Euphrates so in God's conception the dark-skinned races of Adam and Eve belong together for some reason and the same applied to the two fair-skinned races proper to Adam and Eve each of these two pairs of lands recapitulated the original Adam and Eve marriage in two versions the dark-skinned version of Cush and Havilah and the fair-skinned version of the Tigris and Euphrates so what does the red and black pairing for example mean if Cush and Havilah the, those two lands and they appear to be South Arabia and, and Ethiopia on either side of the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden uh, what does that pairing off of the reds and the blacks the darker skinned people mean and then we go back to our sim symbology where the reds represent angels and the blacks represent uh, genetic male mankind why pair off the angels with the men in other words well in the first place these are the two elder types of anthropomorphic beings the angels were created first they were the first beings anthropomorphic beings to be created and then the second was male Adam the Apostle Paul emphasizes the chronological priority of Adam to Eve Adam came first he tells us before Eve and that's important to him in explaining the male superiority factor that exists in Christian culture Adam comes first and Eve second just as the angels come first and resurrection man comes last the red and black alliance of Cush and Havilah implies primitivism or priority of existence so those two red that red black system that we see in the lands of Cush and Havilah represents the two elder racial principles in the sense that they are symbolic of the angels who came first and male genetic mankind or Adam who came second 
The Apostle Paul spells out this primitive priority idea in his great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, especially in verses 46 and 47, which reads, 